How's everyone doing? Yeah, you read the title right. Skeptic to Believer. And I'll tell you why. We'll get into it on this video. Every time I do these live streams, it ends up being like 30 degrees. And I just end up sweating buckets during the whole live stream. Today is the same thing. It's 30 degrees outside. So, yeah, you guys are going to have to let me know again if my mic is working properly. Hopefully it's working good. Everything should be fine at this point. It's the third show, so we should have everything straightened out. Jim says he can't hear me, but then NPC says the mic's okay, so. Somebody else needs to weigh in on that. <laughs> Jim. Jim had me muted, so. Looks like the mic is indeed working. No, I didn't take a selfie with him. However, however, there's been a lot of like interesting posts I've seen online regarding the Patterson footage. And the longer I think about the Patterson footage and the more I look into it, the more I feel like it is a real creature in that video. Like, when I am being honest with myself, I feel like what is in the frame in that video is a genuine creature. Um, recently, Jeff Meldrum posted a photo. It was kind of comparing the, I guess, the, the muscles in, like, the back end of Patty to, like, people and you know, there, there's different examples. It was all being compared to each other. And, and it is almost exact. Like the detail in Patty, if it's a costume, is like next level, next level. And so if I think Patty's a real creature, then I have to automatically think that Bigfoot is real. As weird as it is for me to say that, and as much as I don't really want to like admit that at this point, I feel like I have to like been doing this for years now and now i feel like more of a believer than at any point in time i i think and it's mostly just based on that video like i've experienced some weird things in the bush i've found weird you know things but i get a, i have a really strong feeling that the patterson footage is real so um jim says the patterson film has been beaten to death like a dead horse it sure has it sure has, but that's the uh, the thing is that it stood the test of time. It stood the test of time, hasn't been disproven. The cool thing about the Patterson footage is that if it was a hoax, then why would Patterson be totally willing to bring in so many people to the area to investigate it? Like other researchers, like the top researchers of the time, like John Green, and also like allow them to recover tracks like they made track casts of the paddy trackway which the casts as well have held up they've stood the test of time so you have a perfect scenario of seeing a creature filming it it leaving a trackway and then having the ability to recover you know the track casts you would have to be a really good hoaxer to you know have that all set up so that you know they can like, you're not just hoaxing the costume, you're hoaxing the, the footprints as well. Which is, like, it, that hasn't been done, again, to this day, so. And Pete says, Bob's story never changes. I mean, yeah, as far as I know. As far as I know, I did, like, there are people like Bob Hieronymus that, you know, said that he wore the costume. It does appear, like, when you really dig deep into the story, um, like Patterson was trying to make a Bigfoot documentary. Obviously he wanted to film Bigfoot, right? Um, but he was making films on the subject matter. He had shot so many interviews like of people who have experienced Bigfoot. Um, but I think part of that film that he was working on, he was planning on doing reenactments of some sort. I think they did go to a costume shop probably to get a costume because apparently there's a guy, I think his name was Philip Morris. He um, 
he said that he sold them a costume. But he didn't say it was a custom, like, one-of-a-kind costume. He said it was the ape costume that they would give everyone. Like, it wasn't like a, a rare thing. It was a common costume that they that, that company sold. So I feel like uh, what happened was they got this costume to do reenactments. They had Bob Hieronymus wear that costume. Bob Hieronymus at this point, like after that, thinks that he, you know, was wearing a suit maybe or something. But I don't know. The the creature in the Patterson film, like if that is a costume, that is a one-of-a-kind costume. Like I've never seen anything else out there like that. And there hasn't been any other ones that have turned up unless they modified it somehow. But if you look at some of these comparison photos online that people have posted of the musculature, it's like, it's really good. Even to this day, it's really, really good. Freeman footage is pretty good is what Tim says. Yeah, the Freeman footage is pretty good. It's very, very similar to um, Patty, in my opinion. It's hard to like get a good look on the cassette tapes that it was shot on, but... I've never been much of a believer of the Marble Mountain video. Yeah, I don't believe in, I don't think the Marble Mountain uh, video is legit. I think it's just, like, I don't think it was a hoax or anything, but I think they just misidentified a hiker walking on a ridge. It just, I don't get, it doesn't stand out as being a Bigfoot. Like, it doesn't fit the uh, the profile of a Bigfoot, in my opinion. It's interesting, though. It's interesting, like, if Bigfoot is real, if Patty is real, then that's what it is. That's what it looks like. That's what we have to be looking for. And if Patty's real, then what's the deal with all this supernatural stuff? You know, is it just an illusion of having supernatural abilities? I've always wondered that. You know, sometimes is it a physical creature? Sometimes is it not? I've always wondered that. But what's in that film is a physical creature. So, and I'm kind of, I'm convinced that it, it's legit. Personally, I know a lot of people aren't. There's a, it's probably about fifty fifty out there. Uh, what about all the vocal evidence of Bigfoot? Yeah, there's a lot of good vo vocalizations that have been recorded. Um, and we had just recorded a whooping call back at the in the very beginning of June this year at the Alberta habituation site. That was on the last night we were there too. In some of these areas, it, if, it does seem like when you go to an area to do like an investigation or to go camping or whatever you're doing, it feels like in the first like couple nights, first few nights, nothing happens, but it feels like beyond like that three or four night, um, I guess threshold then like that's when weird stuff starts happening when they're kind of used to you being there. They, it seems like they slowly will start coming in and doing weird things, whether it be making whooping calls or whistles or throwing little rocks into the camp. Those are things that usually happen. I've got a, I'll be pausing here every now and then talking so I can read these comments and see if there's any good questions. Yeah, I do feel like there's a good quantity of people out there who, who genuinely are just misidentifying what they see with no intentions of fooling people, I think that happens way more than actual hoaxes. But there are indeed a lot of losers out there who like to play games with people. Um, Double Duty says, love the Sierra Sasquatch recording. Yeah, the Sierra sounds um, from Ron Moorhead. Those ones like are hotly debated as well. All I can say is that I've had conversations with Ron and I believe him to be a trustworthy guy. And I feel like he's telling the truth. And I've heard other Sasquatch vocalizations that have been recorded that sound very similar to the Sierra sounds. So 
there could actually be something there. Um, somebody asked, "What I? Th how do I feel about Expedition Bigfoot?" Um, I, I haven't really been keeping up with it. Like I watched half of the latest season, but it, it's just a show. Like it's just a show. Anything on a show like that, you can't really take as being, you know, accurate to what actually happened when they were there. <laughs> like, or like, like things could be staged. Even like the presenters on the show, they could be being fooled too by producers and like the crew. So that kind of stuff is really hard to um, verify. But then there was a lot of people who like did digging around in the first season and found a lot of really sketchy information about that show. So, yeah. Mountain Adventure says we need a type specimen. Yeah. Well, that would be ideal. Mountain Adventures, he like he or she or whoever you are, you can go out and get the body. You can be the one to shoot it if you want to. It ain't going to be me, that's for sure. But yeah, obviously to prove something like 100%, you're going to need a, a body of some kind. Polly says, hi, Justin. Do you think that the Patty Bigfoot is still alive? It's possible. That's the thing is like, we don't know how long they live. And that was in 1967. So it's definitely possible. Like that's within like a human lifespan. So um, if Patty is deceased, we'll not, probably never find the body <laughs> because we just don't find Bigfoot bodies. Would you like to do an expedition with Les Stroud? I'm not going to go out of my way to try and do an expedition with Les Stroud. But if he said, hey, Justin, let's go look for Bigfoot, I'd be like, all right. It's a good idea. Let's do it. Um, yeah, that's about as far as I would take that. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I did a, a, some talking with uh, Ben from 401 Files the other day about um, finding a dead Bigfoot, what we would do if we found a dead Bigfoot, you know, like how, I want to know what you guys think. How would you go about bringing the evidence home? What would you guys do? I'm excited to see what kind of comments show up here because I'm sure everybody each has their own very specific like method of <laughs> bringing home the evidence or the entire body. Yeah, Terry says they don't leave their dead to rot. Like, I totally agree. Like, if they're like a people, they're going to they're gonna have respect for each other and they're either going to bury them or I don't know what else they would do. I don't think Bigfoot use fires. I don't think they would, they would burn the dead, but I feel like they would definitely bury them, if anything, or put them in a cave somewhere. Um but they definitely wouldn't leave them out in the open. They would, they, I, I would assume if there are Bigfoot bodies out there, they're buried somewhere in like the worst, most <laughs> like difficult terrain that one could ever try and traverse. There's still people out there too that believe the Peter Kane dog training videos. Do you guys know that? The Peter Kane guy who makes the videos on YouTube of, he's got like frozen Bigfoot parts that he keeps in his freezer there's people who still believe like they even since the beginning like they've believed that that is an actual real creature and that's crazy to me yeah so the deal with the guy in australia it's still going to be happening i've just been super busy lately dealing with other stuff we're going to be getting back into that because I want to try and get this creature or whatever it is or whatever they are on video. So it's coming. It's coming. It's just going to take a little bit of time. 
Have you researched the Port Lock, Alaska story? Um, I have. That's the same area where they've been filming that Alaska Killer Bigfoot show. Now, that show sucks. I'll just be straight up about that. I don't like that show. Um, but, yeah, you're, you're talking about a place in Alaska that is, like, super remote. And back in the day, I can't remember if it was a – what was the industry there? Was it a cannery or something? I can't remember. But you have a remote area with a bunch of people living back in the day. I feel like it wouldn't be out of the ordinary for people to go missing um, in a sense that like maybe there was like a crime or like a criminal or, you know, I feel like crime back in the day in places like that was probably pretty high um, because there was a lot of people that went missing apparently. Justin, what's with the potty mouth? Well, the deal with that is that I'm 31 and I talk like I talk, so. Have you ever seen mini teepees that look like Sasquatch juveniles practicing? I've seen little structures out in the bush. I saw one. I have a photo of it somewhere that I took in Jasper National Park. Um, I was hiking up uh, Old Man Mountain. The actual name is Rosh Banam. When you're in Jasper, you can see this mountain ridge. It looks like there's a face looking up into the sky. Um, I was walking up the trail to get to the top of that mountain, and I saw something just like that. It looked like a little teepee structure, but it was right off the trail. So I immediately assumed that um, I immediately assumed that it was made by people. And you see stuff like that in a lot of places, um, just off trails, you'll see little teepee structures like that. It's just people messing around. I saw a big one in um, the Kananaskis area off of a trail. There's a trail to a little waterfall. I can't remember the name of it, but there was a, a teepee structure like that. Do you, don't you get creeped out going into the woods alone? Yes, I do. I do. It's just natural feelings that anyone would feel. Um, unless you're very, very, very used to it, like, if you're alone, like, it's very easy to get creeped out, but I guess, I think you would just have to be really, really used to it. Like, you'd have to go out alone all the time on all your trips. Um, but even then, I still, like, I still feel like you'd feel elements of fear for sure, especially if you heard or saw something, right? Did you smell any odors while hiking? I haven't smelt anything that I would describe as the Sasquatch odor. I've never experienced that. Um, and f like for the most part, I haven't really smelt anything unusual in any way out in the bush. I mean, I've come across like dead animals on occasion that do smell. Um, but it's usually, it usually doesn't have anything to do with Bigfoot. Just like animals doing animal things, you know. Megan asks, how pumped am I for Monster Fest? I'm super excited for Monster Fest. That's going down in um, Ohio next June, Monster Fest. It's an event put on by Seth Breedlove of Small Town Monsters. So I'm excited to go to that and to be a guest at that, uh, I guess, convention or show or I don't know what you call it. But the lineup of guests is actually pretty cool. They got the hosts of uh, Astonishing Legends. Obviously, like all the small town monsters guys are going to be there. It's going to be really, really cool. Is Dogman a type of Bigfoot or is it something completely different? I'm very resistant to looking into Dogman and I feel like I shouldn't be. Um, because <laughs> there are reports out there like of people running into something that is very dog-like or werewolf-like. Um, I always like to think of that beast of seven shoots photo where it looks like the creature or whatever it is, um, has almost a baboon like face and the jury's still out on that photo too. We don't know if it's real, but I wonder if there are Bigfoot that have baboon like faces. Edgar asks, is finding Bigfoot feces super difficult? Probably. I mean, people claim to find uh, Bigfoot feces and have collected them. There's images online you can find. Um, but the thing about that is, like, excrement is something that 
disappears very quickly in the wilderness. It's very vulnerable to like rain or or the element just the elements in general. Like it doesn't last very long or like hold its form. So yeah, it's it'd probably be way more difficult than finding any other type of evidence. When you see tree structures in the woods, do you try to search for evidence like hairs on the branches or footprints around the trees? I usually look for footprints, for sure. Sometimes, like at the Alberta habituation site where those tree structures are, a lot of times you'll find impressions in the ground, but it's all it's all moss. And sometimes it's kind of hard to tell the difference between like someone's boot that has been there before or like a potential Sasquatch track. Um, it's only really good if like the ground is muddy because then it, it holds more detail. Yeah, and there's a question here from Pete. Do you think the structures are made to live in or are used as markers? I, I definitely don't think they're <laughs> used to live in at all. Some of them are literally just, they, they would be extremely impractical if they were a shelter of some kind. Some of them are just like kind of, they're just, it's almost like art. Like it has no practical purpose, but visually um, there might be something to it. Like if it is something, it's probably going to be a marker or some sort of, maybe a, maybe it's a symbolism of some kind for something. I, I don't really know. Um, and then again, we still don't know for sure if they are building structures. Like that still hasn't been confirmed. But it, I think the odds that they are are pretty high. Do you think they're a type of people or undiscovered ape? I feel like they're more people-like than ape-like, just based on the accounts. You know, you hear the stories of, like, hunters who are looking at them through their scope, and they look at the face of these things, and they're like, wow, this is a person. I can't shoot it. But then again, when I see footage of gorillas and chimpanzees, I'm like, wow, those are really, like, almost person-like so, yeah, it just it just seems based on the evidence and the encounters and the vocalizations that there are more people like when you hear that the chatter vocalizations, it's like, yeah, they are, have definitely figured out some sort of language and are way beyond what an ape would be or, well, I guess we're all apes, but you know what I mean. Yeah, the one thing I need to look into more are these stories of the Nephilim. I'm I'm not like very religious, so I haven't gone through like the Bible to look into that. But a lot of people out there believe that that is what the Sasquatch are. I'm also open to entertaining any sort of theory. What do you think is Bigfoot's intelligence level? I don't know, probably that of like a four-year-old or a five-year-old. I don't really know. Like, that's, that's a question that's almost impossible to answer unless we actually had one and could actually study it. But they do seem kind of playful. I figure it would be close to that of, of a kid, like a human kid but I could be wrong on that. <laughs> Do you feel like Bigfoot can tap into the mycelium network in the forest? I, I feel like Bigfoot, especially in places like British Columbia and like Oregon, <laughs> Oregon, Oregon, I feel like they if they are surviving on the wilderness, if they're hunting and foraging, they're probably collecting magic mushrooms and they're probably doing mushrooms. They're probably eating them. Um, so I feel like that's probably what they do. That's probably the easiest way to tap into the mycelium network. But I, I was told um, when I was in Tofino last year that the local indigenous people of that area 
believe that that's what they can do and it helps them you know sense when danger is around or you know like people and whatnot it helps them stay like it i guess enhances their abilities to stay hidden in that sense so Jim, Jim says, Bigfoot can telepathically speak. Can a four-year-old do that? We have no actual proof that Bigfoot can telepathically speak, Jim. When I say the intelligence of a kid, I mean, like, I don't mean in, like, a telepathic or, like, supernatural way. I mean, like, you know, its ability to, like, problem solve and, you know, make its way through this world. Here's another question that's kind of similar. What do you think of mind speak? What's your opinion on it? I don't know. Like I've never experienced anything like that. And I can't say it doesn't happen because I've witnessed a lot of weird things. I've just never experienced it. I don't know anyone personally who's experienced it, but I have heard a lot of stories. Les Stroud apparently experienced mind speak on multiple occasions. That's something that you can't prove either, no matter what. Like, how are you going to prove that Thomas asks if Bigfoot has bodily hair or fur it, it seems more hair like than fur like a lot of examples of, of Bigfoot hair it, it almost looks like like a long human hair like that you'd see on a, on a woman maybe like six inches long, seven inches long, like along the body. Like it's definitely, it seems to be more, more like, um, hair. Jim says we can't prove the earth is a ball either. I disagree with you. Eating mushrooms does not fit into their ambush predator mindset. We don't know what their mindset is. I guarantee if you ever see a Bigfoot while out in the bush, you'll wish you hadn't. I bet. That's the one thing I always wonder uh, if, I, if I do in my lifetime run into Bigfoot. I wonder how it's going to go down and I wonder how my body and mind will react to it. Because, I don't know, you can run scenarios through your head as many times as you want. And, you know, you can think you'll be a certain way, but when the time comes, when you're actually face to face with like a 10 foot tall <laughs> um, Sasquatch, it's probably not going to go the way you imagined it to. You're probably just like, you're probably going to feel the most intense fear you've ever felt in your life. Also, if they do in fact project like emit infrasound, then that's going to make it way worse. So... Some people say that not only is Sasquatch just scary to begin with to encounter, but they like, they cause you to feel more fear. And um, a lot of people have, have said the same thing. So is it the infrasound doing that? I don't know. But a lot of people like have claimed to have been hit by this infrasound out in the bush and they just basically go down. Like they become super ill and are taken out of commission. David says to go check out Sasquatch Ontario's channel because there's a lot of good proof on there. A lot of the stuff that uh, Sasquatch Ontario has is very, like, reasonable. Like, a lot of the fingerprints I've seen in, like, older videos are very similar to other fingerprints, like, on vehicles that I've seen. And um, the vocalizations and the audio is also very similar. But there's, uh, like, a lot of people don't believe the Sasquatch Ontario channel and a lot of people do it's kind of hard to tell like what is actually going on I feel like he's being genuine but I, I tend to like give people the benefit of the doubt right right from the start so do you have any plans in the near future to collaborate with Ken Walker again yeah like um 
Ken always mentions like getting out into the Nordic area with me and with the Alberta Sasquatch organization. I think he wants to do it more and more now. He's not, I don't think he's doing as much taxidermy work as he was before. So he's got a bit more free time and, and freedom. So I think he wants to get out there a bit more um, into the area where like the habituation site is, where the tree structures are, uh, because there's still a lot of areas back there that have yet to be explored by us. Like we gener generally stick to the habituation site area, but there are some other areas nearby that would be really good. We're, we're going kind of supernatural here in the comment section. There's a lot of interesting comments. Now we're getting into the cloaking. Jim says the cloaking theory is next level. I mean, yeah, like I'm open to the idea of them obviously having a supernatural element or like, I guess, abilities that almost come across as supernatural. But I've always thought that maybe it, it might have some sort of adaptation that allows it to phase out of this, out of our, like, I guess, um, perception. Like, because we can only see certain um, frequencies and whatnot, or light frequencies. So maybe it has some sort of weird natural adaptation to disappear. And... Um, there are ways that there are things in science I could probably explain that like that I don't understand how that would work, but I feel like it could be possible because there's certain animals that can see certain frequencies. There's certain animals that like, I think it's flying. I think flying squirrels can see ultraviolet light. A lot of these animals have special um, adaptations like that. So I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that Sasquatch can maybe slip out of reality. Like just our, I guess our visible reality. Um, I'm weird though. I'm, I'm, I'm open to all this weird stuff. I think it's kind of boring to just think that Bigfoot is just a undiscovered ape like creature or hominid. There are things that have gone on in the world of Bigfoot that are very, 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 very difficult to explain. It doesn't mean they can't be explained, but there might be more to them. I mean, the indigenous people, a lot of the indigenous people are firm believers that they're a supernatural creature of some kind. Like they're very spiritual and have supernatural powers. So, and a lot of people in the Bigfoot community say, listen to the indigenous people, you know? They know what they're talking about. You should be talking to them and interviewing them. <laughs> but then people who talk to them aren't willing to believe the supernatural element, which is kind of silly to me. You should just take everything that they say, listen to it, and just, you know, keep it on the shelf. Mexico has reports for sure. See, I haven't read any reports from Mexico, but I've heard of reports down in like Texas. That's about as far south as I've seen reports coming from. Bob's all butthurt that his question didn't get answered. So ask your question again, Bob, and I'll answer it right now. Oh, this is interesting. The indigenous people used to have a saying where Bigfoot goes, a light follows. That is interesting. A lot of people do report strange lights and orbs in the forest. Actually, I'm pretty sure Ron Moorhead, who recorded the Sierra Sounds, reported lots of strange light, um, I guess, anomalies in that area and a lot of other weird sounds that were also recorded. So Well, Bob didn't write his question down again, so I guess I won't be answering it. <laughs> it 
Dodd Dodd says, what's your percentage in leaning towards Bigfoot is real? Well, in the title of this video, like that should say it all. Like 99%. I'm pretty sure, like I can't ignore all the stories I've heard over the years from people that I trust. That combined with me thinking that the Patty footage is legit, like I can't deny that either. I can't believe the Patterson footage is legit and then not believe Bigfoot is real. Because if the Patty footage is legit, then Bigfoot has to be real. Stuart, what is the glag story? You'll have to explain that. There's another comment here. It's hard to imagine the PG footage is the only real evidence after all this time. I, I wouldn't say it's the only real evidence, but because there's other examples of evidence of all different kinds out there, but it is... I guess one that is the most difficult to deny. Like it really has stood the test of time. And um, like other examples of footage too haven't actually been disproven. Like I don't think the Freeman footage has been disp disproven. I think it's also held up to a degree. Yeah, I was thinking, like, I get a lot of questions asking, like, where should I go if I want to find Bigfoot? Um, how do you find a location? Like, if you're going to get into, like, investigating Bigfoot and going out into the wilderness, it's like, where do you go? Where do you actually start? It's like finding a needle in a haystack, and the needle might be imaginary. Um, but if you can, if a person can collect reports and figure out where the vast majority of them come from. And you get a sense of a general area. And then you can go on like Google Earth. And you could look, get an overhead view of a, you know, a, a, a decent sized area. And then you can find where there are areas that are kind of untouched by like industry. That's kind of what I did when I first started out. I, I went on Google. I knew where stories were coming from. And so I went on Google and I tried to find areas that looked like they had never been logged and there wasn't a lot going on as far as industry goes. And um, it turned out that that area was very close, like very, 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 very close to where the tree structure site was. Now, is that a coincidence or, or did that method work? I feel like it's a good way to go about it. Find these areas that haven't been touched. Um, find waterways. You know, you want to walk the waterways, the rivers, because the ground sometimes can be muddy. And you're, you're better off in spots like that for finding tracks. Um, and that's what I would do. I would just work those waterways and, um, you know, periodically trek off into the bush looking for structures and things of that nature. What's this Pennsylvania Suscon Screamer? What is that? There's a couple um, comments in here asking about um, incidents that I've never heard of. So there's a couple here now that I'm not really familiar with. Yeah, it's one thing um, me and Ben noticed 
like we notice this a lot is that there's a, a very large unwillingness in the Bigfoot community to be open to people's ideas. It's not a bad thing to theorize about what might be going on and what Bigfoot is. It's not a bad idea. Um, when people are very firm in what they believe and, and like, like that is a very poor way to go about exploring something, you know, you want to be open to the possibilities like 50 years ago, 60 years ago, so many people did not believe in UFOs and aliens. And I feel like nowadays, like 90% of people believe that UFOs and aliens are real. When you have an open mind about something, it it allows you to explore things more thoroughly, I think, because then you're covering more bases, right? Like you're not just focused on a flesh and blood creature. You can investigate that, but then you can also bring tools into the bush with you that would help you explore more of the supernatural ideas and theories, you know? It's good to have people in all camps researching the one subject because then you have all these all your bases covered and we have better odds of figuring out what's going on hey thomas thanks for thanks for joining here Um, back in 2011, winter of 2011, I was in, um, the Lac La Biche area here in Alberta. And, um, I was doing a week long cross country ski expedition in the bush. So all the lakes were frozen for the most part. We were just skiing across these frozen lakes. And at night we would stop on like an Island and set up camp and then we'd, we'd continue on. It was a pretty like intense trip. It was minus 30 like the whole time. But I remember, this is obviously before I started doing the Bigfoot thing. I remember um, the one night we were camped out on this little island and um, we would hear these three, like it sounded like classic wood knocking sounds. We'd hear three of them and then nothing. And then you'd hear three of them. I was familiar with Bigfoot because I watched like Monster Quest and all these shows through like high school and whatnot. But um, I remember telling the people I was with that that was a thing that Sasquatch did. Maybe to communicate or whatnot, they would make knocking sounds, usually in like sets of three. And after I told them that, what, what I said was they'll, they'll make these calls to communicate maybe. Um, if we just wait here and listen, I bet you will hear something from like the completely opposite direction. And so we were just stood there listening and sure enough, we heard three knocks from, you know, the completely opposite direction, the middle of nowhere in the dead of winter. Um, so it was kind of fun to think at, at that moment, at that point in time that it could be, you know, Bigfoot. Um, but I never really took, like at that point, I wasn't really taking the subject seriously. Uh, but back when I was making um, my film Expedition Sasquatch back in the beginning of 2018, I was talking to Rob McNeil from the Alberta Sasquatch Organization, and I told him that story. And he said that probably around the same time, they had reports, like Sasquatch reports from that area. People were seeing a creature... Um, like every now and then they would see it, but every time it was encountered by somebody, it would be a little bit further east. So it looked like it was actually, I don't know if it was migrating, but it was on the move. So it, it, they would see it more west and eventually it got to like the Saskatchewan border. But I think there was like three or four reports. Yeah, I'm going to have to look up this Suscon thing. It's a good thing about doing these these live shows is it's a good way to get more information and more stories. And stories are just stories, but also there's a lot of good information that you can take from them as well.
Mackenzie says Monster Quest was my favorite show. Monster Quest is probably the thing about Monster Quest compared to something like Expedition Bigfoot is that it's more documentary like. It's not a reality show. So they have interviews with scientists, with experts, um, with experiencers, and they just give you the information. There's some, you know, kind of cheesy reenactments here and there, but you know that they're reenactments, right? Like it's more of an informational show. It's not like entertainment. That's what I really liked about Monster Quest and about all of Doug Hychek's, um films. I also, I recently made a video about the, the Sasquatch fingerprints showing up on the car windows. And like the next day I saw people posting like pictures that they've taken of the exact same thing. That happens quite often, which is actually pretty fascinating. Whenever you guys are out in the forest and you drive out to an area, check your car after because you might get something like that. When this, when I'm done streaming here, I'm going to go through the comments and take some notes because there's a lot of like encounters and, and things to take note of here that I should look into. Megan asks, do you, I think I'll venture out to the Maritimes or the East Coast on an expedition? I would if there was some solid reports. Otherwise, it like I feel like if, if I was going to go out east, it would have to be like in the area that Alex Petikov is in from Small Town Monsters, like in New Hampshire. Um, they have a lot of like dense wilderness out there. I think that's probably as far as I would go and into like Ontario, obviously, and maybe Quebec. Um, but there's not much for reports out on the actual coast. Not that I'm aware of anyway. I feel like I'm definitely more inclined to venture out to the West coast and to Vancouver Island because like the reports out there are so abundant and they're crazy too. And, um, there's a lot of, Bigfoot history and lore out uh, in British Columbia and on the West Coast, a lot of indigenous lore. And um, that's the place to be. Maybe one day I'll move out to BC. And then um, we'll be able to do content out in the bush, you know, in every video. Wouldn't that be great? see Terry said northwest of Jasper. I'm not sure what he's referring to, but uh, the Jasper area here in Alberta is obviously pretty good as well. If, if um, like Obviously, it's a national park, so you're kind of limited in what you can do out there. But you have the David Thompson reports from back in the day of them finding tracks in that general area. And then back when I was in Wildfire, one of my bosses was telling me that back in the day, I think it was his uncle and his dad or something like that were out hiking in the Jasper area. And there was like a cliff above them and something was up on that cliff throwing rocks down. And they, apparently they actually seen the creature and, you know, they believed it was Bigfoot. So, and then actually I need to get more details on the story because Ken kind of told it to me, but he didn't really get into very many specifics. But apparently somewhere in Jasper, there was a cabin and a bunch of young people were staying at this cabin. I think they were hikers or whatnot. And somebody from that group got taken and went missing. So that's very strange as well. I think it was kind of covered up and uh, wasn't really like talked about that much. I want to say Ken actually knew somebody who was involved but I'll have to check in on that. And I knew of a guy who was a friend of a friend's who went missing in Jasper and was never found. Like they, he was gone. They never found him. So that is very strange. Like in a place where you feel like you're going to be safe, you're going to the national park, well-used trails, there's people everywhere. I mean, it doesn't seem like you're that safe. 
Rick asks if I've personally seen a Bigfoot, and that's a negative on that one. And that's the case with most researchers or investigators or whatever you want to call yourself. A lot of people who look into the subject um, have not seen Bigfoot or have had any crazy experiences. Usually they, maybe they'll hear a weird noise or something like that. Oh, you know what's interesting? Ben was telling me about this. Um, we talk sometimes about Bigfoot mimicking other animals, things like horses or owls or things of that nature. Um, Ben was telling me about this bird. I can't remember what kind of bird it is. You'll have to look it up, but there's a bird that mimics other noises and it can mimic a chainsaw, the sound of a chainsaw. And it sounds exactly like a chainsaw. It can do other noises too. Um, I think if you Google like a bird, go on YouTube and search like a bird makes chainsaw sounds or something like that, you'll find it. It's fascinating. So if something like a bird can make those noises, we know like certain birds can actually like talk if you teach them. Then I think a primate that is very close to human wouldn't have any problems mimicking, you know, a horse or an owl. I mean, there's people out there who are like impressionists and they, that's what they do is they make themselves sound like other things or people. So I don't think that's something that is um, too crazy to believe. Tim, I haven't heard of this cow man of Cop Copalis Beach, Copalis Beach. But I have heard a lot of stories where people describe Bigfoot as a cow man. So in the Ruby Creek in incident in British Columbia way back in the day, the famous Ruby Creek incident, I think it happened in the 20s. The kids who saw it described it as a cow, like a hairy cow. Um, and then I also, I saw this like, it was an information plaque thing out at some truck stop in British Columbia. It was talking about like the prospecting days, you know, when everyone was out searching for gold in BC. And supposedly these gold prospectors and miners, they would use camels that they brought in to pack gear. Um, and I, what it said on this plaque was that a lot of Bigfoot, uh, Bigfoot reports have actually been sightings of these camels either from the back or like head on that people have seen through the trees. And they're like, what is that thing with like long legs? Um, so people had been misidentifying um, a camel for Bigfoot. So how often did that happen? I don't know. But uh, I guess they used camels and had camels walking around in the bush for some reason. I guess it's kind of the same way with a moose, if you look at a moose like head on or from the rear. But then again, there's that footage from Calgary, that family who, who um, filmed one in the winter across the river. A lot of people are like, oh, that's a moose. But if you look at it, it's like definitely not a moose from the back end. It actually looks like a Bigfoot, like a big hulking Bigfoot with big muscles. And I, I think that footage is legit for sure. Leanne asks if I have Instagram. I do. You can search my name, Justin Chernopesky. You can find me on there. I don't really post on there very much, so. Yeah, there's a comment here, red-haired Sasquatch, and I saw one earlier saying something about an or orangutan. Um, the hair, a, a, the hair on a lot of these um, creatures is very like looks a lot like that of an orangutan. Like it's reddish orange and it's long. If you look at an orangutan, it has long strands of hair. It's a very comparable. Nino says they've been watching all my videos, waiting till I run into them. I mean, you might be waiting a long time, to be honest. 
I I am totally fine with me not running into one throughout this whole Bigfoot YouTube career. And if it happens, it happens. That'll be great. But if it doesn't happen, I'm still going to keep going. Still going to keep looking. Edgar asks, what, what's the scariest Bigfoot scream you've ever heard? There's some pretty popular screams that have been recorded in vocalizations, but the one that scares to me is one that was actually sent to me back, I want to say this was 2018 as well. Um, There's a couple that were camping in the early season. I think it was maybe early May or something like that, mid-May, at a place called Ram River Falls here in Alberta. They were the only ones in the campsite. Ram River Falls, too, is, is a camp area where a lot of activity has been reported, especially in the early season, like in May or in the spring. Um, and they started they started hearing these noises at night that sound like it, they sounded like screams and roars. The, I, I compare it to the T-Rex in Jurassic Park. Just a very like guttural, like roaring scream. And it went on for hours. The guy had his, I think he recorded it on an iPhone or something. He just left it on. So they had a really long um, audio file to go through. But um, if you search my videos, I think I made, made one called Wild Man, the Bigfoot Odyssey or something like that. Um, you can actually listen to that audio clip. I put it in that film. So, yeah, that one scares me the most. I find the scariest because not only does it sound like very intense and like something very powerful and big, um, but it's in an area which is like very close to where I go exploring. So the habituation site um, where the tree structures are is north of Nordegg and this Ram River Falls is it's south. It's not too far south, but. It's in the Nordig area. Nordig is obviously one of the biggest hotspots in the country. Squatching Cowboy, hey, Joe. Uh, he asks what I think about Bigfoot using fire. Um, there, there hasn't really been any evidence ever found of that. So uh, at least not that I'm aware of. I feel like they can get by without it, just like every other animal that exists out in the same area that Bigfoot exists. Somehow, all these other animals have found ways to survive without fire. When is Quest for the Wild Man coming out? Very soon. So I, I don't know. I think in the last live stream... And in one of the Boots on Bigfoot videos, I put footage in. Um, I've been working on building the vehicle, the expedition vehicle for Quest for the Wild Man. Like, it's finally going to be, like, done. And we're finally going to be out there. Like, and all the events of the last two years, like, in the world, like, with, you know, everything going on in the world that we don't want to talk about on YouTube, kind of really, like, put the brakes on that project unfortunately but it's finally coming to fruition we finally have an expedition vehicle we can get out there for an extended period of time with all of our gear and be comfortable and comfort is key for some of these trips because if you're not comfortable then you don't want to be like doing research and investigating you only want to be doing that stuff when you feel comfortable and you know when you have the energy so i'm really looking forward to that so there will be more news in the very near future on that because the, the vehicle, the Land Rover, is almost done, which is good. And also, like, the way it's kind of, it appears to be lining up is that we'll be out there filming in the shoulder season pretty much the exact time of the year, like, when Patty was filmed. And that's kind of what we want. We want that shoulder season because in this Nordic area, the shoulder season in the spring and in the fall is when you get all the crazy reports and when the, all the like actual visual sightings happen. So, There's a comment here. Um, I just checked out your Henry Lake video. Damn, that place looks creepy. Yeah, Henry Lake is a creepy lake up in the middle of nowhere. It's just a small lake surrounded by mountains. And if you go there, you'd be like, wow, 
this is where you would find Bigfoot. The only crappy thing is that when I was there, um, it was quite a few years after my dad was there when he had his experience. And when he was there, the area around the lake, like the, the slopes around the lake had have been logged now and they were logged when I was there. So I feel like my chances of actually having something happen were greatly diminished by that. Um, but when my dad was there and he had his experience, it was all just like pristine forest. Pretty unfortunate, but it, the place is like still pretty creepy. And I'm sure there's lots of other great areas in the, in the general vicinity that would be really cool to check out. There was actually, uh, I've had people who, who had watched that video and they actually ended up going to Henry Lake to check it out. So just um, be careful because if you drive up the road to Henry Lake, there's a chance you could get locked in. So uh, a funny story that actually isn't in the, the video in the film, Wild Man, is that when I, got, uh, when I was leaving Henry Lake, driving down the road, to get in there, I had to pass through a gate that was just open. It was an open gate, like a metal gate. And I thought Henry Lake was just a lake people went to to go fishing and relax. So I didn't really think anything of it. Um, when I was leaving, the, the loggers had actually closed the gate and locked it. So I was trapped on that road at Henry Lake. And there was like those, you know, those giant like concrete blocks. They had those on each side of the gate too. So I could drive around it. So the moral of the story is to always keep a set of bolt cutters in your car when you're, you know, exploring lease roads and, and roads where there's industry because you could get trapped somewhere. It happened to me. I was lucky. I was very lucky that like, uh, these logging companies, they have, they hire security, right? And I was able to flag somebody down to let me out. But I was worried because I was running out of food and like, I would have had to stay there over the, like the next weekend. So yeah, bolt cutters or something to be able to release yourself from a gate <laughs> that closes behind you. That's something you should take out into the bush. Uh, it's something a lot of people don't think of either. But if you drive into an area, you might get trapped there. The Nahani Valley is still very remote. Oh, the Nahani Valley. The Nahani Valley is a hard, would be a really hard area to explore because it's all protected. I'm pretty sure you can only really venture in there if you're with a guided tour. Yeah, guys, asking questions about specific people, I'm not going to answer them, no matter what we think of them. So I'm not going to do that. I, I would explore the Nahani if I could. I, I don't think it's very feasible right now. Like, it, it would have to be, because it's so protected, it would have to be, like, a big production, probably, like, an actual TV production to be able to get permission to, like, film in, in some of those areas. Is there another Mountain Beast Radio episode? So Mountain Beast Radio like didn't end up going anywhere. Back when the channel first started, me and my buddy Doug, we wanted to do something more like a podcast. And so we recorded, I think, three or four episodes of what we called Mountain Beast Radio. But it, the episodes weren't really even related to Bigfoot. We did one on like artificial intelligence. We did one on the Amityville Horror and I can't remember what other ones we did, but um, yeah, it just kind of fizzled, fizzled out and we never ended up making any more of them. The, the Bigfoot videos kind of are what caught on, so I kind of just stuck with that. Where would you go to try and find Bigfoot if you could go anywhere that you wanted? Okay, if I'm looking for, like, the North American Bigfoot, I would want to spend as much time as possible on Vancouver Island in, like, the Tofino area. 
a lot of great reports in those areas from like the locals who've lived there their whole lives. But my dream would be to go to like the Himalayan mountains and look for the Yeti. That's like kind of what captivated me as a kid was the stories of the Yeti. And um, I remember I used to be obsessed with the show, um, The Adventures of Tintin when I was a kid. And they had a two-part episode called Tintin in Tibet. And it was my favorite episode. And they end up encountering the Yeti. And um, yeah, so I would love, I would love to go to like Nepal or Tibet and uh, do an expedition looking for the Yeti. Um, Josh Gates did that in his show Destination Truth. And they actually found a very interesting footprint back in the day. There's somebody here mentions um, the DLF Pass, Mackenzie. Um, it's, it's crazy. People are still like, there's new articles coming out still about the DLF Pass and people like claiming it's been solved. I don't think it's been solved. I also don't think it was an avalanche. I don't think it was a Yeti either. Um, to me, the the evidence suggests there was some sort of like i feel like it would have had to have been explosions of some kind honestly to send people into a frantic like a run down the mountain with no clothes on i feel like that's kind of what happened some sort of explosions maybe some weapons testing um there were reports of parachute mines being dropped into the area so it could be something like that but uh, I've never been confident in, in the Yeti theory for the DLF Pass incident. And the one photo that people say is a Yeti does not look anything like what a Yeti or a Bigfoot-like creature would look like. DA Roberts is in. Hey, it's going good, man. I hope you're doing well. More questions about Port Locke, Alaska. I've only looked into it briefly once. I made one video about it, I think. And um, yeah, I, I can't really say what I what I think about it because I don't know. I you have stories about people going missing, and obviously there's a lot of Bigfoot reports in Alaska. And I think Les Stroud had a weird experience in Alaska, so. You know, it's not without the, like, out of the realm of possibility that, you know, what was going on at Portalock was Bigfoot, but there, there hasn't been anything dug up to confirm any of it. Don, Don Don says, how big is the biggest Sasquatch you've heard of and believe? Um... Back in the early 60s here in Alberta, when they were building the Bighorn Dam in the Nordegg area, they reported seeing Sasquatch creatures that were watching them build a road at heights of up to like 15 feet or something crazy like that, between 12 and 15 feet. Um, the thing is, I, I believe they saw them from pretty far away, so it'd be kind of hard to judge that height, but that seems pretty generous, you know? Most of the in most of the reports you hear, it's like between seven and like nine feet tall. Um, like fifteen feet is actually so high. Like if you see, like go look at something that's actually fifteen feet tall. Or a, a, there's diagrams too. There's pictures online of people like there'll be like a person and like beside them they'll have a twelve foot tall Sasquatch and it's ridiculously tall. Like how does something that big stay hidden? That's what I want to know. Have you ever heard of the Battle of Ape Canyon? Yeah, so the Ape Canyon incident is one of the most famous Bigfoot incidents out there. Where one of these creatures was shot and apparently like fell down this cliff. And afterwards at night, like the cabin came under like a insane attack and they were bombarded with rocks and the creatures were like banging on the cabin, punching through the chinking on the cabin and trying to get at these guys. I wonder 
you know, if they were actually able to get into the cabin, what they would have done, or if it was just all intimidation. I feel like if they really wanted to get in there, they could, you know? The cool thing about the Battle of Ape Canyon, though, or the Ape Canyon incident, as it's more commonly known, is that there's paperwork, like, actually, like, that's been discovered showing that these people who put so much time and energy into being at that spot to do what they were doing, like prospecting. They put so much energy into being there, building a cabin and doing all this work. And then all of a sudden, like this is on record on paper, they had up and left for some reason that it didn't make any sense. So something must have happened to get them to want to just up and leave. You know, they were already, they were very invested in that spot. So I, I feel like the uh, Ape Canyon incident is is legit. Squatching Cowboy says, I don't think there's big here in Texas, maybe six or seven feet. And there's no reason for them to be as big as they are up north. A lot of people speculate that. They they think that the Sasquatch down south are smaller than the northern Sasquatch, which is kind of the same with, like, bears. The further north you get, it seems that the bears get bigger and, um, I guess, more robust. They have to be because the elements out here are a little bit tougher, especially in the winter. So... I mean, it wouldn't surprise me because you don't hear reports of like 10 foot tall skunk apes running around. Have you heard of Orang Pendic in Indonesia? I have. I have heard of that. I've looked into that. And there was that one piece of video that came out. I can't remember exactly where it was. I don't know if it was in Indonesia, but it was in the jungle somewhere. And these guys were riding on a dirt bike down this little trail. And the grass on either side of the, the trail is pretty tall. And um, a little man of some kind, you just look like a little man, like a pygmy or something, comes running out of the grass, crosses the road. I wonder if that could be uh, something someone would I misidentify, you know, for like or impendic. Um, But one of my favorite stories is, is the story of the Vietnam rock apes. I, I, I think those are true accounts, to be honest. But when you think about that, it's like at that point, are you even talking about Bigfoot or an undiscovered, like whatever, like it could be something undiscovered, but I mean something more person-like. Would it be something like that? Or is it more of like an actual monkey? Because you are in areas where there are monkeys and apes that just live there naturally. Um. If anyone wants to um, watch a really good documentary, there's one. If you, I, I think if you were to go on YouTube and search the Chinese wild man, you'd find this documentary, but it is from the 90s, I think. And it's a really well put together documentary on the Chinese wild man. Um, so I recommend going and watching that. I found it very interesting when I was listening to Jeff Meldrum's presentation on the Patty footage and on Patty's. Um, footprints um there was a team in china that found tracks that almost exactly resembled uh patty's tracks and they even had like the mid tarsal break and everything i find that fascinating and like in china that's where you know gigantopithecus remains had been found like the teeth and the pieces of the jaw so i don't know I don't know what's going on. I don't know what Bigfoot is. I'm open to all of this, but it's interesting investigating and talking about all these different theories because, you know, that could be something. Like, if that was the case, if if the Chinese wild man is almost the same as um, the North American Bigfoot, it's it when you talk like that, it, it sounds like an actual flesh and blood thing, doesn't it? That has just migrated into North America. 
but what's the deal with all these supernatural encounters? You know, are there multiple things out there in the woods? Are, are is there a flesh and blood Bigfoot and also some other weird like spiritual creatures? Who knows? Terry says there's 600 pound boars here. I saw a crazy video on the internet the other day. Uh, it was in the winter and these people were getting charged at by like a gang of wild boars and they're shooting at them because they had to. It was crazy. That would have been a terrifying experience. Giganto is thought to be a quadruped like the gorilla. I've heard that too. I've heard that the like the upper body mass of a, a Gigantopithecus would be so great that it would have to be on all fours. There's been Sasquatch reports too of it being on all fours as well, but uh, mostly on two feet. Terry, I'm, I'm not going to be able to reach out that way, so you'll have to reach out to me. Just go to my Instagram. They have they have boar hunting in Edmonton or outside of the city for years now. Yeah, I actually there's there's been one time in my life where I've actually seen a wild boar like out in the bush uh, near Pigeon Lake, Alberta. It was running along the ditch, and I, at first I thought it was a giant dog until I kind of got in front of it and saw the big tusks coming out of its mouth. So, yeah, they are out there. Rock apes are real. I have uncles from that war that ran into them. Are your uncles still alive? Because I would love to hear about that. Clayton. I would at least love to hear your stories. If they told you stories, I would love to hear that. Yeah, so we've been going for an hour and 15 minutes here. I'm going to think about signing off here pretty soon. So if there's any last-minute questions, if I didn't get to your question, <laughs> quickly type it in at the bottom, and I'll try to get to it here. Do you have any good Native American stories? My favorite indigenous stories are from British Columbia, and they're the stories of the First Nations women being taken, like the, the Seraphine Long story. She was taken and held captive for like two years, and she was finally able to escape. That's the one where um, they put tree sap in her eyes, tree pitch so that they would be sealed closed so she wouldn't be able to know where they were taking her um i love those stories and then in modern times we have like um down near like morley alberta there's a lot of stories that come from the first nations people down there like um west of calgary to this day you know you get stories so what kind of camera are you using? That's what Joe from Squatch and Cowboy asks. Um, right now I'm using a Panasonic G85. I like it because it has really good image stabilization and it shoots really nice 4K video. Here's a good one. Let me know about my thoughts on dogs tracking the creatures and why they don't use it. I don't know. It's interesting. Like, there's so many cool things one could do um, when out looking for Bigfoot to try and find it. So many different things one could, like, implement to help in the search. But for the most part, the people who are looking into Bigfoot, like, don't have a lot of resources or, like, like, I don't know anybody with tracking dogs or how I would even go about doing that. I have no experience doing that. You know, I'm not about to go hire somebody to go into the bush with me with tracking dogs. Um, but when the Patterson footage was shot, after it was shot, I'm pretty sure they brought tracking dogs in there. So 
that just adds to that mystery too. That's why I think it's real because, you know, Patterson was fine with them doing that. Oh, here's a good one. Do you believe orbs and Bigfoot are related? I was talking to Ben about this the other day because Ben from 401 Files, he believes like Bigfoot is ET. Like he believes it's alien or related to aliens somehow. That's what he believes. Um, and what I was thinking is that maybe why a lot of these like light orbs and stuff are seen when there's Bigfoot sightings as well um, is that maybe Bigfoot are actually without knowing of the CE5 protocols, you know, like the, the close encounters of the fifth kind protocols of like meditating and bringing in like aliens and like alien craft into your like vicinity. Maybe Bigfoot do that. Maybe they are so in tune with the world and with the universe that they're actually doing CE5 protocols. They don't obviously don't call them that or call them anything probably, but maybe they have a way to, to communicate like that because there are people that are doing that. They're practicing these CE5 protocols and then they're filming like light phenomena and, you know, having all these weird experiences similar to what I've been experiencing outside here. If a person like me or anybody else can do that, I feel like maybe Sasquatch could do it too. And that's why like people have experienced both, you know, Bigfoot and UFOs at the same time or almost at the same time. Justin, what's the meaning of life? I don't know, dude. Well, let me know when you figure it out. Probably to just like gain wisdom. I don't know. Is the PGF, the Patterson Gimlin film, still the gold standard for video evidence? I would say so. Uh, that's what I think is, anyways, the gold standard. It's crazy, too. On modern cameras nowadays, people have not been able to get a shot that clear. Isn't that insane? Modern cameras are so advanced compared to, you know, the Kodak motion picture camera that they shot that on. Um, and also there's so many more cameras out there. Most people who go out into the mountains, go hiking, they have a camera and then like, Everybody has a phone, every adult at least, and maybe like teenager has a phone. It's crazy that like that must mean that they are very, very rare. Or, you know, they avoid the technology. I'm still like very much so considering getting a film motion picture camera. I might not be able to get Super 16 because like 16 millimeter film is significantly more expensive than Super 8. So I might just get a little Super 8 camera. And then I, I don't have to worry about loading the film in the daylight as well because it's a cartridge. Terry says uh, they can't take a clear selfie and neither can I for some reason. I photograph very poorly. Um, here, Justin, can we, when can we expect the next research video? So I'm going to be going out into the bush real soon. And, uh, we'll light up. the goal is always to film as much content as possible when you're out in the bush, but a lot of times it doesn't go the way you plan. Um, but I will do my best in the next couple of weeks to get some good stuff for you guys. That's the plan. A lot of times real life gets in the way and you get held back from going out into the mountains. Like, there have been a few times this summer where, I, where I've planned to go out filming and other stuff has come up and I've had to stay in the city and, you know, deal with stuff. But, yeah, I think I'm going to cut her off there, guys. Thank you so much for joining uh, this stream. I'm going to be trying to do these more often. I, I find doing live videos kind of awkward and, and it's more nerve-wracking than, than pre-recording something and editing it. And you don't know what's going to happen on a live video, you know, so. 
I'm just trying to like get out of my comfort zone and, and get used to it. So thank you all for sticking around and watching and uh, I hope you have a good evening weekends coming up. Hope you have a great weekend. Hope some of you go out looking for Bigfoot. Hope somebody finds it. And uh, if you do, let me know. So thanks guys. I'll see you next time.